Professor Shantosina, thank you for having breakfast with UNICEF. There's now a decision to draft legislation to ban all child labour in India up to the age of 14. Why has it taken so long? First of all, I must say that I'm glad that it is happening at least now. Uh, and it is happening because the right to education is a fundamental right. Uh, the reason why it has taken this long is difficult to say, but I think there has not been an elite consensus that children must not work at all in the country and they must be in school. Neither the bureaucracy, nor the politicians, nor the corporate sector, neither uh, even the intellectuals. You've seen Myron Weiner, who's written the book on state and child in India. He's very clearly shown why children are still at work and that he is attributed to a lack of consensus in the society, especially among those who are in power and authority, that children must not work at all. How many children might be affected by this legislation? See, if it was uh, the traditional conventional definition of child labour, then it was about some 12.6 million children. But if we are talking about all children out of schools, engaged in all forms of work, whether wage work or non-wage work, whether working for the families themselves, then it could be anywhere between 70 to 80 million children. How important then has the Right to Education Act been in this fight against child labour? More than anything else, I think schools are instruments for bridging inequalities in the country, for breaking the cycle of poverty. So it's, it's a, it has such a radical uh, role to play in a developing society such as ours, especially for children and their rights. I think few would disagree with you about that transformative power of education, but is it a right that can be enforced? Of course it can be enforced right? and I think it's, we are moving in that direction and since you talked about rights, now in this 21st century and in our country and most countries, we are talking about children's rights. We are not talking about welfare of children and we are talking about state obligation to see that children get their rights uh, you know, and their entitlements. I think it is possible, it is doable and it has to be done. Is there a more important thing that you've worked on in your career than this? One has simultaneously worked on building uh, capacities of the school teachers and the schools to perform and to be very favorable to the first generation learner because we found that the schools as they are designed now uh, are not sensitive to children whose parents have never been to school. And uh, even the parents do not know how to negotiate with the school system because they have been illiterate. So this is the uh, work that we did on building trust between the community of parents who were illiterate and the school system which did not know how to deal with illiteracy. But you feel the resistance, that, that, that resistance from wherever it may be, lobby, business, that's been removed and now it's more a question of an enabling environment, budgets, capacity. I, I think yes, it's no more a debate on whether a child must work or must be in school. That debate is closed. Now we are all discussing how to get them to school. It's not why children are at work, but how to get them out of work and get them into school. So there is a different set of debates where we are looking at solutions, we are looking at challenges, we are looking at how to solve the issue and uh, go further on to the next step. How do you go to that next step? How now in that enabling environment to get all of India's children into school? I would think there are four essential components if you talk about the governance aspect of it. First of all, it cannot be an overtly centralized program. It has to be decentralized where local bodies are given the authority to monitor children and their rights and their right to education. And if it is decentralized, then it has to be far more flexible because each child requires a plan, each child requires a way of addressing and all of it cannot fit into a centralized plan. And it plans for children have to be made at the level where the child is and I think flexibility is very, very important. It's also an issue where it cannot be resolved only by an education department. It is so interrelated, education, health, labor, welfare, protection and somewhere there has to be a conversation between all these departments and so far they have all been seen in silos and I think it is so important that there is a conversation. And finally I think children's own voices are so important. They have to be in the knowledge that they are being discussed and they must also participate in what they are being discussed about and it's so important that we listen to children and to see that they are part of the entire process of empowering them. They have to exercise agency for the success of this program. Shantasena, thank you very much.
Thanks a lot. I enjoyed it too.